Ninth Story Studios, giving story a voice. You're listening to The Wicked Library. The Wicked Library is a horror fiction podcast and may contain themes, ideas, stories, and other things that many people will find disturbing. You have been warned. Hey everybody, this is Daniel Foytek, and I am the host and producer of The Wicked Library. I just wanted to take a minute today to welcome you to another episode of The Darkness in Between. While we're working on our new season, we want to keep bringing you some great stories, and today is no exception. Before we dive into the story, though, I do want to say thank you to our sponsor for today's episode. We don't do a lot of sponsored episodes of The Wicked Library because I kind of feel that the sponsors that we do work with either have to have something to do with what we do here in the horror community, or it needs to be something that I believe in and I think that the audience will benefit from. So today we do have another episode sponsored by our friends over at Magic Spoon. Now, we've been in lockdown here for over a year now, and many of us, I can speak at least for myself, have become more sedentary and put on some extra pounds. If you're like me, you're at the point where you're trying to be more active and eat better. But healthy breakfast doesn't have to be boring. Magic Spoon has the amazing flavors you love, but without all the bad stuff. And as I started working out again, I found that it is a delicious way to get my protein before and after my workouts. Not only does it have zero grams of sugar and 13 to 14 grams of protein, but there's only four net grams of carbs in each serving. Only 140 calories per serving. It's keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, low-carb, and GMO-free. And they've given us a special promo code to help you save $5 off your first purchase over at magicspoon.com forward slash wicked. Just go over there, grab a variety pack, and try it out today. And use our promo code wicked at checkout to save $5 on your order. Magic Spoon is actually so confident in their product that it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. For me, breakfast cereals like these bring back the nostalgia of being a kid, eating those fun breakfast cereals and watching great cartoons on the TV. Now, I don't watch a lot of cartoons these days, but I do love listening to horror podcasts, and a big bowl of this delicious cereal is always a great accompaniment. Remember, you get your next delicious bowl of guilt-free cereal at magicspoon.com slash wicked and use the promo code wicked to save $5 off. That's magicspoon.com slash wicked and use the promo code wicked to save $5 off. And a big thank you to Magic Spoon for sponsoring this episode. Now, without further ado, let's dive into today's story by Carl Hughes. Limbo by Carl Hughes, told by Louis Pollard. Judd and his four mates got bladdered on their crawl through the drinking dens of Pentanon Sea, a resort that that November night resembled a wasteland of shredded summer dreams. They had a good reason for their piss-up, or at least Judd had. Thanks to his buddies, he cheated the law for the first time in his life, and that was all the excuse he needed to blow a month's benefits on a legless night out. They started at five o'clock with a curry at the Taj Mahal in a back street that smelled of dead things from the fish market. Then they traipsed from pub to pub and ended up at Mr Tom's night spot. A pit of a place that occupied the crypt of what was formerly a Benedictine priory and that stank like a sumo wrestler's scrotum. A din of heavy metal swelled between the whitewashed walls down which condensation ran in strobe-coloured rivulets while floozies with ginormous tits and microskirts latched onto any bloke who'd give them a good time. A couple of heavies, their skeletons made of girders topped by heads of granite, ejected a group of black guys whose only offence seemed to be their colour. The men left with quiet dignity, but Robbie, one of Judd's mates, said, They've done F all wrong. I'm going to complain about them pieces of shit what call themselves bouncers. No, you won't. Not unless you want to get your nose busted and your balls mashed to a pulp said Gaz, another of the mates. So they turned away and got on with the serious business of blitzing themselves into oblivion. Finally, when the club closed, Judd, his mates, and all the other piss artists spilled onto the foggy street. 
the five buddies had the remaining hours of the night to kill before they could head for home 50-odd miles away on a bus that wasn't due to leave until 8 o'clock in the morning. They'd bought return tickets, so had the means of transport, even if all their dosh had gone down their throats in liquid form. What now? Chris asked, clutching a bottle that he'd secured with the last of his money. God knows, Judd said. First thing I'm going to do, though, is take a leak. Which he did against the window of a funeral parlour. His mates followed suit, and Paul screamed through the letterbox. Fuck all you stiffs in the chapel of rest! I'm only here for the beer! This tickled their funny bones, and for the sake of raising the dead, Judd booted in a glass panel in the door. Afterwards, they reeled down the street, taking turns swigging from Chris's bottle. When the bottle was empty, Chris chucked it into the roadway, where it smashed and presently ruptured a late-night taxi's front near-side tyre. I'm shagged, Dave said. There's hours yet before we can go home, and this fog's freezing my gonads. I'm going to find a shop doorway to get some kip. The fog seemed to be thickening, rolling in from the sea with the stink of kelp and brine. A dog howled in the distance, a lonely note like a siren from a hinterland of the lost. The only other sounds were the slop of the sea on shingle and the rattle of a train on the nearby crossing. Shimon spewed in the gutter, retching so much that it seemed his guts were about to explode. For some reason, that seemed to act as a trigger for the friends to break up and wander off in their solitary ways. Judd guessed they'd all find shop doorways, but he'd never been able to sleep rough. Once on a tenting holiday, before his old man ran off with the tart from the upstairs flat, he'd scarcely slept for three nights. Tent life and rough sleeping weren't for him so he knew he wouldn't manage to doze off in the cold, wet fog, whether he found a doorway or not. But as he wasn't prepared to walk around for hours, especially as his head felt as if it was starting to detach itself, like a bit of plasticine from his neck, he slumped down by the entrance to the pier and drew up his knees as if he were still in the womb. He felt pissed in every sense. After 15 minutes, a cop car pulled up and a plod and plod s got out. The man had a pockmarked face, as if he'd come into contact with a galaxy of wandering asteroids, and the woman looked as if she'd swallowed a rancid trout. What are you doing? the plod demanded, Judd staring blearily. Killing time till morning, he said. Not here, you're not. Shift your ass before we run you in for being drunk and disorderly. Judd frowned, then immediately wished he hadn't, as it squinched his head into a tight band that felt like pressure to the brain. Still hugging his knees, he said, What the fuck are you on about? I'm not disorderly. I'm sitting here doing no bugger, no harm. The plod and plodess exchanged glances. Then the woman said, You're disorderly if we say you are. If you doubt that, see which side the magistrates come down on when we drag you into court. This wasn't a new experience for Judd. Once he'd been beaten up by a couple of thugs in uniform while attending a football match. Not because he'd been rowdy, he hadn't, but because those saints of the constabulary hadn't liked the way he'd looked at them. It had been the same with some of his mates. None had had good dealings with those supposed paragons of justice. Sure, sometimes it was their own fault, but often they'd been set upon only because of who they were. Knowing better than to argue, and realising Plod would be on his back soon enough anyway, Judd got up and headed back into the town centre. A cold wind had got up breathing the death rattle into autumn leaves, but at least it was serving to disperse the fog. Don't think you're going to get away with this. We'll nail you for something, you bastard. That's what Police Constable Jackson had said three days ago at the Crown Court after Judd had been acquitted of robbery and causing grievous bodily harm. He had his mates to thank for that acquittal. In August, he'd mugged a decrepit pensioner in a wheelchair, knocking her to the ground and unfortunately breaking her arm, though he reckoned that was her own crazy fault for getting caught beneath one of the wheels. And he'd run off with her handbag. A waste of effort it proved to be, for the bag contained only a few measly pounds, a laminated bus pass and a lipstick-smeared paper hanky. And yet, for that petty misdemeanour, he'd faced a long stretch inside, what with his past record. But his mates had come forward to testify in court that he'd been with them, 60 miles away at the time, cheering on their motorhead pal Terry Jesmond in a rallycross event. As the only independent witnesses to Judd's crime had been a pair of old biddies who'd seized up with fright in court, the judge had ordered the jury to dismiss the case. 
an excellent reason, therefore, for this piss-up at the coast. And may the forces of law and order fester for ever in a stinking cesspit of rectitude. Judd spent the rest of that night at Pentanon Sea, huddled in the doorway of a crumbling high-rise block of flats, a monolithic eyesore encased in cobwebs of scaffolding. The building probably needed the support of metal to remain upright, he thought sourly. He felt cold and miserable, his head aching as if a gnome with a bill hook were scraping away at the detritus that had collected on the insides of his skull. A clock on the Gothic town hall struck the hours of three, four, five, and the town slumbered in a stillness usually found only in desert tombs or forsaken dungeons beneath the walls of crumbling castles. Dawn eventually filtered through, cloud the colour of unwashed linen, and Judd stood up, his joints having seized like rusty joists. Bone-weary, hungover, mouthed, feeling as tacky as a glue factory. He slouched down to the seafront, and there he met up with his mates, who resembled things dredged from sewers. I could murder some breakfast, Chris said. Christ, the thought of greasy bacon makes me want to spew up like Seisman did last night, Judd told him. Anyway, we've got no skrill, not a bloody sou between us. What time do you make it? Robbie asked. Just after seven, Gaz said. Nearly an hour before the bus leaves, and I hope none of you's lost your tickets because it's a fucking long walk home otherwise. With the cold, damp air wafting through the early morning like corpse breath, they made their way to the bus station. Other pedestrians were now out in dribs and drabs, all looking as if they'd remained half in yesterday. Cars and motorbikes appeared in increasing numbers, their exhaust fumes coiling and coagulating in the murk. The bus station was a big, drafty place, with tattered posters, their messages obscured by graffiti. Splintery benches were set out at intervals whilst waste paper, cigarette ends and matchsticks had formed a sticky paste on the concrete walkways. Chris delved into an overflowing rubbish bin and came up with a half-eaten hot dog. Anyone want a congealed sausage? he asked. Judd, for one, felt like gagging at the thought. Chris tossed the sausage away and ate what was left of the stale bread roll and onions. The breeze increased to a frigid weave of rank hair, creating a tumble of dead leaves that crackled like the lids of ancient trapdoors. Time passed and eventually their red double-decker bus pulled in, its interior lights as welcome as beacons on a dead sea. The five friends piled aboard and climbed to the upper deck, luxurating in the warmth that dribbled through the heated vents. Few other people were travelling far at that hour, so the bus contained only a dozen passengers when it left. Stretching out on a double seat, Judd said to his mates, I'm stun gone shagged, wake me up when we reach our stop, and don't fucking forget. Count on it, Shimon said. Didn't we save you from a long stretch in the pen? You're good mates, I owe you, Judd mumbled already drifting into a slumber that carried him on waves of warmth into the arms of mother comfort. Exhaustion, the rocking of the bus and its pleasant growl of engine kept him under for a good long time. He dreamed of wandering through a series of tunnels, always sloping deeper underground. His way lit by flaming torches that revealed cave paintings that may have been left by Neanderthals. He knew these daubings were meant to convey messages, but he found them as frustratingly cryptic as crossword clues written in Klingon. One dream morphed into another. He fidgeted, moaned about nothing that he could afterwards remember, and finally turned over. And landed on the floor. What the fuck? The bus had stopped, and its lights were off. No more cosseting warmth from the vents. Judd levered himself to his knees and looked around. Apart from himself, the upper deck was empty. Where in the name of God were his mates? Then he looked outside and saw that during his kip, the bus had reached the depot, Journey's End, which was nearly twelve miles from the stop where he should have got off. Other buses were parked in silent ranks all around, like metallic monoliths. 
The only illumination came from a few weak strap lights in the roof. Incensed, Judd realised that his mates had left him to sleep on while they alighted. Those lousy, filthy bastards! No doubt they thought it hilarious to abandon him, letting him become stranded without the means to get another bus or a taxi home. He didn't know what they had between their ears that passed for brains, but he'd known greater nouse in pickled shit. He wished them all the way to hell in a wankfest wagon. And what about the effing driver? Shouldn't he have checked that the bus was empty before he parked the thing up and tottered off for his tea break in the canteen or wherever he'd pissed off to? Cursing, damning his so-called mates, Judd nursed his aching head for a few minutes as silence pressed in like dense and sodden cotton wool. At last, he got up, descended the stairs and pressed the emergency button to open the door. An eerie emptiness greeted him. Emptiness as in the absence of humanity. No one was moving about the depot. There wasn't a sound of a voice or a football or even a cough. Just the noise of a frolicking wind outside, like some wild beast let loose from a zoo. Hello? Is anybody there? He shouted, then muttered to himself. Stupid bloody question. This isn't a seance. He soon realised it might as well have been, for no one replied. Only the echo of his own voice reverberated around the cream-washed walls. Beginning to feel spooked, he picked his way between the ranks of buses until he reached the depot entrance. The vast frontage opened onto what Judd judged by its width and clutter of shops to be one of the main streets of town. Cars, buses and lorries occupied the roadway in both directions, just as anyone would expect at the height of rush hour chaos. Yet, they were all stationary and driverless. And the footpaths were similarly deserted. Not a soul moved. Only a discarded newspaper blew along the street in a lusty wind. Judd stood astounded, gazing around. His heart thudded slowly, metronomically, but too loud for comfort. There was about the morning a quality of light that came from the fading year, paler, as though the landscape it revealed were a product of over-diluted watercolours. In this strange and furtive reality, Judd's shadow stretched long and warped like something misfired from a kiln. Above, the sky was filled with puffballs of cloud that resembled an explosion in a powder factory. After a minute, he took a few steps to his right, then stopped again. His brain pulsed out a furnace of wild ideas, unbridled and coagulated. It seemed he'd entered a ghost town. The wind tore at his hair and rattled through the branches of a withered tree that stood at the roadside like a long-dead sentry. He took a deep breath and bawled. Where's every fucker gone? Answer me! Somebody! Apart from the gusts of wind that harried his voice away, only profound silence greeted him. Evidently, the town had been abandoned. Judd had never been one to handle stress well, and now he found his agitation level rocketing off the scale marked panic. That metronomic heartbeat had turned into a pile driver working overtime. His breath came in spasmodic bursts, his fingers clenching and unclenching. He stabbed frantic glances up and down the street. At one end appeared a gabbled palace, with a clock tower and an ornate porticoed entrance probably the town hall. At the other end, rearing out of a graveyard, stood a church with a stunted spire, a thing that looked as if its builders must have considered it bad manners to poke holes in the sky. Swallowing convulsively, he moved on, increasing his pace from a fast walk to a run. He ducked into several shops, screaming for service that wasn't forthcoming. He even did what previously he'd considered unthinkable. He entered a police station without being dragged there. The place smelled of sweat and vomit and disinfectant, but of plod there wasn't a hint. An incident book on the counter showed that the last entry had been made the previous night. 
Outside again, he came to a ruined office building that had evidently been gutted by fire. Sooty smoke, smears and scorch marks seared the stonework around its windows, and the wreckage of what remained of the roof timbers resembled blackened bones. Judd was about to pass this place, when movement from an upstairs window brought him to a stop. A woman was standing there, gazing down at him, a young woman with flaxen hair like summer straw and an enigmatic smile that could have been filched from a mugshot of the Mona Lisa. Hope leaping from his heart, for never had he been so glad to see another human being, Judd was about to call her when she moved away and out of sight. Hey you! Come back and talk to me, you crazy bitch! He yelled. Tell me what the fuck is going on! He waited for only a few seconds before kicking away the panels of plywood that covered the building's entrance. Inside, he found the dereliction he'd expected. Walls were down, rubble piled in clumbers of wreckage, door frames burned to charcoal. The air hung heavy with the stale stench of smoke and burned timbers. He looked for the stairs that would take him to that upper floor where he'd seen the woman. The stairs didn't exist. Neither did the upper floor. It had fallen in. No doubt during the fire that had ravaged this place, which meant he'd either imagined the woman or she'd been a ghost. Neither explanation appealed. Heart palpitating, throat gunged with phlegm, Judd worked his tongue around a mouth that had turned greasy. Then a flittery movement to his left made him jump. He wheeled around and saw the woman moving away from him along what remained of a corridor. A diaphanous gown in silken pale blue floated around her like ectoplasm, and her feet made no sound on the rubble. Hey miss, please, just stop and talk to me! Although the desperate words came out choky and glutinous, they were audible enough in that dead place, but the woman gave no sign of having heard. She continued to move away as if on a cloud. Oh, come back, you bitch! Judd stumbled after her, having to climb over the debris. One scorched plank almost tripped him up, but he kicked it aside and blundered on. The woman didn't appear to be in a hurry, as she merely drifted, somehow unimpeded by the rubble. Not once did she have to climb over anything or step around it. She seemed to waft leisurely, as if on a coil of breeze. Judd kept shouting at her, telling her to stop, but she never faltered, never turned. They passed from corridor to corridor, through one chamber after another, an impossible labyrinth in which Judd lost all sense of direction. After what felt like an eon in the convoluted system, he told himself in any normal reality, they must have surely by now found themselves outside the building. But the place just went on and on its dust choking and making him wheeze. He felt he were on a slow motion track to a nowhere world. Eventually, they came to a passage that seemed scarcely to have been touched by fire. Its wood block floor was clear of rubble and looked to have been swept recently, while its sky blue walls revealed only minimal smoke smudges. The air still reeked of burned wood, but a cool breeze from the broken windows was doing its best to dispel the worst effects. The woman drifted along silently and serenely, Judd pounding in her wake but drawing no nearer. The passage ended at a door the colour of sapphire, almost iridescent. The woman reached out for a handle that Judd couldn't see, and the door opened. She passed into a room of fluttery light that suggested illumination from candles. Judd hurried after her, and the door closed behind him with a sigh like a dying breath. He'd been right about the candles. Dozens of them flickered in bronze sconces set around the walls. The stone-floored, windowless chamber was scarcely bigger than the cells he'd occupied during his scudgeons at Her Majesty's pleasure and the grey stone walls were just as austere and uninviting. To the right was a door, so white that it could have been fashioned from a fresh fall of snow. On the other side was a second door, this one as black as the devil's armpits. All of this occupied Judd's attention only peripherally. What riveted him were the two people looking over him 
with cool assessment. One was the woman, of course, the other infinitely less savoury and squatting like a great ugly toad behind a metal desk, was a man with bulbous eyes and a head so bold that it appeared to shimmer in the candlelight. A cape, the colour of Stygian night, encased him from neck to ankles. What the fuck is going on here? Judd demanded. His question emerged as no more than a rasp. Panic had written itself large in his psyche. The man and the woman exchanged glances. Then the man returned his attention to Judd, eyeing him as if he were a diarrhea-inducing virus. What brought you here? the creature asked. His voice sounded as harsh as pumice on broken glass. The fucking bus, of course. That's not what I meant. Do you realise where you are? Crot's full on bollocks for all I care. I want to know where every fucker's gone. The woman spoke for the first time. Her voice sounded as glittery as tinsel, as delicate as a spider's web. Judd, she said, I am the angel of the future, and my colleague here is the demon of the past. What the fuck is that supposed to mean? And how do you know my name? Judd took a step towards the desk, then a step backwards. His innards felt like jelly on ice. The toad-like creature addressed him as if he found Judd as loathsome as a turd burger. You, my friend, have somehow, through carelessness and a warp in time, entered limbo. The place where the past has happened and the future is waiting to come about. Limbo? I don't want to be stuck in limbo for Christ's sake, Judd yelled. I've my whole life to lead. Anyway, isn't limbo some Catholic crap? I don't go along with all that religion mumbo jumbo. I was brought up an atheist, thank God. The man drummed his fingers on the desk, setting up a reverberation that frayed Judd's nerves further. What are you thinking? Judd demanded. What my colleague is thinking is this, the woman said. She had a beautiful face, like something Michelangelo might have sculpted in marble, but Judd wasn't into aesthetics just then. You have a choice to make, Judd. You can accompany the demon through that black door into your past, where you'll be reborn again and live your entire life once more, while remembering nothing of what's in store for you as the years unfold. Maybe next time you won't fall asleep on the bus and your life will unfold as it were meant to. And what's my other choice? he asked. It was the demon of the past who answered. Your second option is to accompany this lady, the angel of the future, where you'll pick up your life, where it left off, when you entered limbo. The future will catch up to you and you'll resume your life for however long or short it was meant to be. He spread his hands. It's up to you, my vile friend. Judd somehow managed to get a grasp on his scrambled wits. There was no time to dissolve into petrification. He reckoned he'd had a shitty enough life without electing to go through it all again, with all that probation, jail, and people always getting on his back when he really wasn't such a bad bastard. He nodded, decision taken. I'll go with you, my darling, he said to the woman. I'll carry on what I left off, stepping into the future. Which may not be what you expect, of course, as by its very definition, the future is unknown, the angel said. Yeah, yeah, sure. Can't we just get on with it, for Christ's sake? I'm pretty pissed off, let me tell you. As you wish. <laughs> and good luck. <laughs> the demon of the past said, with a greasy chuckle that improved his frog face not one bit. The woman held out a hand and Judd moved to take it but before he could do so, she moved off. He followed her through the white door and then through the labyrinthine ruin. This time, the journey took less time than had their progress the other way, and within a few minutes, Judd was emerging onto the street. He stared. The place was still deserted. Where's the fucking future I was promised? He demanded. But he was asking the question into a vacuum, for the angel had disappeared. Frantic again, Heart pounding like a pile driver on steroids, Judd raced up the centre of the road, screaming for the future to come and claim him. Which it did. 
Suddenly, the buildings and the very air rippled as if seen through a fast-flowing crystal stream. Sounds emerged from the ether, building to a crescendo of rush-hour noise. And then there were pedestrians and traffic on this major thoroughfare. Judd heard the blast of horn only in the seconds before a number 84 bus ran him over. At the inquest, which was held in the gabled town hall with its clock tower and ornate porticoed entrance, the bus driver swore that the accident hadn't been his fault. The bloke just appeared out of nowhere, just like that, he said, and snapped his fingers. Other motorists and a handful of pedestrians all said the same, leaving the coroner with the easy option of recording a verdict of death by misadventure. People who do rash things, such as running in the centre of main roads in busy periods, are architects of their own doom, he said. It's a sad truth, but being reckless we all ultimately get from life what we deserve.